Here's another anomaly that'll keep the guys laughing. What we have is the Fisher Space Pen, the famous pen that they used on all of the Apollo missions. And if you look at the details of this particular pen, it is rated at 45 PSI inside using a compressed nitrogen canister inside the pen. And that gives it the ability to write upside down so that if you're in zero gravity, you can write in all directions and it can be used underwater and all kinds of other stuff, right? The temperature range is from minus 30 to 250 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's all fine and dandy. However, because it has a small nitrogen canister in there, that canister is only capable of going to an elevation of 12,500 feet because of the low atmospheric pressure. If it goes higher than that, that little nitrogen canister is gonna blow up. However, in the Apollo documents, we have an astronaut that actually wrote in the cue cards and it clearly states that he wrote this at the base of the ladder before he got back in the LEM, just before a rest period. And he simply wrote in the cue card that on December 1972, the spirit of peace in which we came be reflected in the lives of all mankind. And that was written in a full vacuum. The pen, of course, is not going to work in that vacuum. And as soon as they depressurize the LEM or the CSM or, or whatever do a spacewalk, this pen is going to fail. That nitrogen canister is going to just simply blow up. The nitrogen can is going to be like a can of Coke or Pepsi or whatever carbonated beverage of your choice. It's going to explode. And here's the video to prove that. <laughs> but it doesn't matter where you go and look at the details of this. The Fisher Space Pen, as much as people say that they spent millions of dollars to make this pen, the Fisher Space Pen was developed independently and sold to NASA, I think, for like $15 a piece or something like that back in the 60s. The fuel tanks that are on board of the LEM outside, those were made out of titanium. And that's the reason why they don't explode in the vacuum. Now you take this Fisher space pen, the cylinder is not made out of titanium, so it's going to be just like putting a can of pop inside of your vacuum chamber, turning it on, and boom. That's right. That's why it was only rated to 12,500 feet. That is clearly stated in all of the documents that this pen doesn't work above that altitude. It's designed to overcome the gravitational force so when you're writing upside down it keeps the ink pushed against the ball so that it expresses itself and it was also waterproof enough to work underwater that was the design of it the ink must have been very specially made to work down that it wouldn't freeze down to minus 30 but of course the lunar surface got a lot colder than that so it would be interesting to see how NASA can explain that this thing worked and that apparently they had them available for all missions. And of course, anything Russian were doing, they were using pencils because of this very problem. And it doesn't matter who wants to argue with it. The documents are so clearly stated in this particular item on this pen that nobody can argue with it. One of the most interesting points about the Fisher space pen is that it 12,500 feet, you're down to about 10 PSI. 35,000 feet is about 5 PSI, and that's about the same pressure that the LEM and the CSM, or the command module, was running at in their trip. So the pen wouldn't even work at that pressure, because it would have to be at least good for 35,000 feet to work even inside the craft. When you take it outside, it's definitely going to fail. Another anomaly is in Apollo 17 is Tracy's Rock. And it was named for uh, Cernan's daughter, Tracy. And the name was given when Alan Bean did a painting of this particular rock. 
and he actually wrote in beside where the handprint on the rock where the dirt was disturbed, he wrote Tracy on there for Cernan and of course sold this painting. But that particular rock has some very unusual anomalies. On the right hand side of that photograph, okay, when it's being shot around to the other side, you can see that they needed to use a form and the dirt is very, very smooth and you can see the curve of it. They actually had to put probably a plywood form up there to hold the dirt in place to create this particular piece of equipment. What is unusual about this rock is it seems to be about the same height and dimensions as the lamb itself. And in Apollo 17 being that it was the very end of what they were doing, I can well imagine that they probably buried the equipment in this rock just to hide it all before they got rid of all of the items on the set. Absolutely amazing dimensions of this thing, even right down to the legs and everything else on this particular rock, simply would house a limb. And they did spend a lot of time around it and took a lot of photographs of it. What amazes me is that when you take the limb and you superimpose it over Tracy's rock, the one leg that sticks out on the corner, it almost matches with the leg of the limb. That's right. And if you look at the details in the top of it, you can see pieces of metal sticking out. You can even see an area where it matches where the secondary strut would come in on a leg. Pretty amazing. Just another Apollo 17 anomaly that will be completely argued with and unexplained. I mean, the only other thing they would do to it, the one for the Apollo simulations was simply a mock-up. So it wouldn't even be good enough for a museum piece, like all the rest of them are. What really surprises me is, like you said, the form. When you put plywood up and you strip it away from a concrete form, that's exactly what you get. It's nice and smooth all the way around. Yes, and then there's one area where you can see a rock has been pushed up to it. Just like they took a blade and just shoveled that rock right up to it. That's absolutely incredible. And you can see it quite clearly that that rock, it was just like a blade that pushed the dirt up on the back right hand side of that rock. Unbelievable. You can't imagine this. And of course, there's nothing in the lunar surface that would be able to create that. And the fact that he climbed up on top of this thing, that's almost impossible. There's one photograph where he's shooting down from climbing that rock. And yet you don't see any marks where he climbed up on that rock but he's up there and took the photograph shooting down at the other astronaut. These guys are claiming that the suits are not flexible, and yet we see these guys on their knees bent fully upwards to their chest. Climbing that rock would be probably the most dangerous and stupidest thing that you would ever do if you were actually on the moon. One slip and it's all over. For both of them. I mean, it takes two of them to get off the surface, so if one guy is disabled, they're pretty much screwed. Of course, they didn't have any concerns like that because they were never there. They were simply running around Flagstaff. It does look and appears that they simply, to get rid of the evidence, they simply buried it. They created this rock, they put a spring form up on the molding of it, and you can see that clearly on there, and that's just undeniable. Beautiful, smooth curve on it. And of course, people can argue about that all day long, how that's created, but we all know how it was created. I was looking through the journal site at some of the photos that they've added in there. I don't know when they were added. I haven't seen them there before. But there's quite a few new items being added to the journal site all the time. And I came across these photographs of Neil and Buzz practicing on the simulation set that they had, the indoor set, uh, practicing opening the equipment. And here is the S-band antenna being opened up and deployed by Neil Armstrong. And as you can see, it's quite a little operation to get this thing up. There's probably another 10 or 15 photographs in the series. They start at S69-31152 but all of those within that area 
of those photographs on the journal site are sitting there showing that they needed this S-band antenna. My question is this, if they needed that S-band antenna, then why aren't they setting this up on the moon when they get there? Well, I think when they sent the prop guys over to set up the set to do the final simulation, the full dress simulation, it was just forgotten. This is what I don't understand, is that when you practice putting this antenna together as they did, that's for a purpose. So nobody does anything without a purpose. So their purpose is to learn how to set this equipment up on the lunar surface. But we've gone through all of the Apollo 11 videos, photos, and there's not one sign of that dish anywhere. Now, if this dish, which is claimed that they needed it for the television camera, then it would have to be set up so that the television camera would show Neil coming down the ladder for the first time. And if they needed this for communications and data, it would also have to be connected to the experimental package. And of course, if you look at even Apollo 12 and 14 that had an S-band antenna, the experimental package is far too far away from the S-band antenna in those photographs. And of course, if they needed it for the camera in 12 and 14, they wouldn't have it to come down the ladder in those ones either. And if they're using it for communication as well, as claimed by the ones from 15, 16, and 17, then they wouldn't even have communication until it was set up. Quite interesting how they can communicate on the descent with the way it rolls and flips around to come into land and go around the back of the moon as well without losing any communication. Pretty amazing stuff that they did back then. Of course, in simulation, anything is possible. But there it is right there. Piece of very technical equipment that they obviously needed simply was omitted. 12 and 14 had this antenna. Yes, but they're claiming that the only reason why those other Apollo missions needed that antenna was to broadcast the color television signals and then of course everything else was broadcasted through it or and received through that dish whereas Apollo 11 they didn't need a dish because they didn't have color equipment right and 15 16 and 17 they claimed that the one on the rover was doing the job of this piece of equipment here and until the rover is set up and aligned, and every time they move it, it would have to be realigned, you'd lose a signal. Yeah, well, that's a good point. On the descent, when that craft is rotating. Absolutely. Uh, they would have to stay with the antennas on board. The LEM would have to automatically align themselves with the Earth at all times through all of the maneuvers. And that's impossible. That dish was operated on a hand crank, so they would constantly have to be adjusting that dish. Yeah, hand crank and fly it. Yeah, and fly it at the same time. And go around the back side of the moon and not lose a signal. It must have extended out past the moon on each side as they were going or something. It just had a huge long arm that went out so that it would always be in direct visual contact with the Earth. Absolutely amazing, absolutely impossible. They would not have forgotten this piece of equipment if they needed to have it and practiced using it to set it up.